Thank you, brothers and sisters, for telling us your story. The columns here we see cannot be ignored. They stand as sentinels to the persecution of our sisters and our brothers. They bear witness to the destructive force of evil, trying to overwhelm our sensibilities and disrupt our hope in God. When a disturbed man walks into the very sanctuary of a church, sits with African Americans studying God's word, and then methodically shoots them, our call to love is challenged. When a three-year-old Syrian boy whose family was fleeing violence washes up on shore in Turkey, our call to love is challenged. When a plane with 220 people on board, including 17 children, is blown up by terrorists over Egypt, and when young people are gunned down at cafes and a concert hall in Paris, our call to love is challenged. When co-workers are murdered at a Christmas party in San Francisco, what are we to do with such horror? Is God's kingdom reign in illusion? Is Jesus really Lord of all? Are our prayers a mockery to pain? Tonight, we go to scripture and to the Holy Spirit to guide us with these questions. We go to our Lord Jesus Christ and to his own story in Matthew when he himself was faced with the very underbelly of darkness. The audience of Matthew was also a persecuted and a suffering church. They probably lived in Antioch, an occupied city of squalor, poverty, slaves, and immigrants. Jewish believers escaping the Judean-Roman wars were not welcomed by other Jews in the synagogue. They were a suffering and a persecuted church, a suffering and a persecuted people. These first believers knew about the cross. They knew about the resurrection. They knew that in the end, Jesus would come again as their king. But what they needed to know then was what Jesus did when he was facing his own persecution. Before the horrors of the cross and the glory of the resurrection, Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray. His garden prayer in Matthew 26, 36 through 44, is a raw emotional reduction of the Lord's prayer. Jesus wrestled in agony. His grief was so profound that Luke notes that he sweated drops of blood. In his prayer, he prayed over and over, three times saying, not my will, but thine. Three times is a literary device used in the Bible to denote completeness. Jesus wrestled in prayer over and over and over again until he accepted, fully accepted, emotionally, mentally, and physically, that he was putting himself completely in God's hands. He prayed until he internalized a complete trust in God's sovereign plan. 
In Matthew 26, 36 through 37, we read, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be grieved and distressed. Whenever Jesus was in Jerusalem, it was his custom to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. The disciples were used to going there with Jesus, and he often prayed late in the evening. But this night was different. Before the Garden, the disciples had experienced the thrill of the triumphant Henry. They saw Jesus drive money changers out of the temple, a prophetic act against the corruption of the religious system. Jesus had healed, cast out demons, and had even raised the dead. Jesus was invincible. And then they had the long, strange Passover meal. Jesus washing their feet, all his words. Jesus talking again about leaving them. Judas leaving, and Jesus referring to him as the betrayer. Everything was strange and disorienting. The story in the Garden of Gethsemane is really two stories. The story of Jesus and the story of the disciples who were with him. Stories are meant to be entered into. So in this story, of course, we are not Jesus. We are those disciples. This is our story. We are the sleepers. We too are weary, weary of the onslaught of evil. We are overwhelmed. We want to turn away. We can't do anything about the pervasive overshadowing of evil everywhere you turn. Yet Jesus went to prayer, and he took his closest friends, those who knew and loved him best. We are Jesus' friends. We are in the garden with him. And then in 38 and 39 of Matthew, Jesus said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. These words, overwhelmed with sorrow, are also translated cast down. These words used by Jesus are a reference to phrases repeated in Psalm 42 and 43, which says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Three times the psalmist writes, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And after each plea, the psalmist responds, Hope in God for I shall praise him. In his great sorrow, Jesus was crying out scripture, which both affirmed his pain and affirmed his hope. He cries out to his father with scripture, 
Then he tells his disciples to stay here and keep watch with me. But he finds them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not keep watch with me one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Keep watch doesn't mean that Jesus was just trying to keep them physically awake. He wanted them to watch with him, to be alert as persons vigilant to this very moment, like a sentinel, like these pillars, watching, watching, bearing witness to the pain. We don't turn away. We bear witness to the pain. The word also means to rise up and is used to refer when prophets rise up and proclaim God's word. In other places, it means to rise up from the dead or resurrection. Watch is a word that is linked to prophets and would be linked to his resurrection. So when we watch, when we watch, we are hoping for the resurrection. Watch means to wait expectantly for God to act. When things get tough, we tend to go numb, shut down, or get angry, reactive, and controlling. Instead, Jesus asks us to watch, to wait and pray for God's will to be done. We wait for God. God is our hope. God is sovereign. Jesus says, watch with me. We are not watching alone. Jesus stands with us, watches with us, the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost stands and watches with us. Jesus tells his disciples to watch and pray. He knew what was before him. He knew his suffering and death would have a huge negative impact on his beloved friends. He tells them to watch and pray so they will not fall into temptation. What is the temptation? The temptation is to lose hope, to believe that God is not God. With Jesus' capture, conviction, and death, all the disciples' expectations would be dashed their vision of a new kingdom sorely tested. This is the temptation we all face when there is persecution and evil, whether in our own lives or others. We get disillusioned and overwhelmed. We wonder if God is good or whether God cares. We lose hope. Even though in our spirits we want to trust God, our bodies are weak. In Gethsemane, in prayer, it is there that we acknowledge that in our own will and power we cannot do this. We cannot overcome evil through our own efforts. What do we do? We watch with Jesus and pray. For what do we pray? We pray for God's will to be done. We pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. God calls us to bless and not curse. We don't need fancy pious words or long prayers. We simply stand in witness and pray. Not my will, but yours. Not our will, but yours. 
When we pray like this, we partner with God's eternal purposes and God's astounding capacity to love despite the hate. Even the persecuted, as you have heard, know the power of this type of prayer. Today's persecuted Christians know that the best response to persecution is to pray for the persecutors. On February 15, 2015, 21 men working in Libya were executed by ISIS. These men were Coptic Christians from a small village in Upper Egypt, seven from one family. They were uneducated, poor laborers who traveled to Libya to work and send money back to their families. Twenty were Egyptians and one was from Ghana. Isis told the Ghanaian he could leave but he wouldn't desert his Christian brothers. He knew he would die with them, and he chose that path. Isis gave the Christian men opportunity to convert, but they refused. These uneducated and gentle men were willing to die rather than deny their Lord. These 21 men dressed in orange with their executioners dressed in black knelt down by the Mediterranean Sea and their lives were taken from them. Witnesses report that they were praying to Jesus up to the very moment of their death. These are our brothers, these are our fathers, and husbands, and they have gone to be with Jesus Christ, and they prayed. Who knows what miracle came from those prayers? When Jesus aligned himself with God's kingdom, in the end, the victory was clear. Jesus overcame death. When we align ourselves with God's kingdom, in the end, the victory is clear. There is always a resurrection. Always. 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 Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, watch and pray. Amen.